Paul Zendel's groundbreaking novel, The Pigman, was published in 1968, establishing the young adult genre in fiction and earning its place as a timeless classic still cherished by teenagers in classrooms today. Through the unique dual perspective of two high school students, Zindel delves deep into the intricate thoughts, fears, and impressions of teenagers, exploring the essence of kindness and empathy. The novel received critical acclaim, securing the New York Times Outstanding Book of the Year Award in 1968, a spot on the ALA Notable Children's Book List, and recognition on the Horn Book Fanfare Honor List in 1969. Despite its popularity and educational value, the Pigman faced challenges and controversies over the years, leading to its classification as one of the most frequently banned books of all time. The inclusion of teenage drinking, cursing, and a perceived disrespect for adults offended some parents, deeming it inappropriate for young readers. In fact, it ranked 44th on the ALA's list of most challenged books from 1990 to 2000. However, the novel's significance in addressing authentic teenage experiences and promoting empathy remains undeniable. Paul Zindel expanded on the story with a sequel titled The Pigman's Legacy, published in 1980, and later shared his own personal journey in his autobiography, The Pigman Me, released in 1990. Zindel's work also reached the big screen through a 2001 film adaptation directed by Owen Emerson, utilizing Zindel's own screenplay. The Pigman revolves around the lives of John Conlon and Lorraine Jensen, sophomore students residing in Staten Island. Together, they compose an oath, dedicating themselves to crafting an epic memorial for a person they refer to as the Pigman, vowing to share the unfiltered truth. The narrative unfolds as John and Lorraine take turns recounting their encounters with Angelo Pignotti and the subsequent events that transpire. Their unlikely friendship sparks when they meet on the school bus just before starting high school, with others unable to comprehend why the charismatic and rebellious John is drawn to the unassuming and introverted Lorraine. However, their bond strengthens as they navigate the challenges of dysfunctional families and share a mutual appreciation for independence. Lorraine, specifically, resides with her single mother, who works as a palliative care nurse. Driven by a deep-rooted hatred for men stemming from her ex-husband's betrayal, Lorraine finds herself trapped under her mother's controlling grip. Every aspect of her life, from her wardrobe to her mode of transportation, falls under intense scrutiny from her overworked and hostile mother. Lorraine bears the weight of constant judgment regarding her behavior and body size, while also resorting to lying about her whereabouts to spend time with John and his friends. Dubbed the bathroom bomber due to his penchant for setting off firecrackers in the boys' restroom, John has earned a reputation as a prankster and a liar. Despite his mischievous nature, he manages to navigate life with his charm and quick wit. Similar to Lorraine, John faces the hardships of an unhappy household, seeking solace in alcohol, a trait passed down from his father, and chain smoking. In stark contrast to Lorraine's controlling mother, John's parents display little interest in his day-to-day -day life. His father only acknowledges him long enough to draw unfavorable comparisons to his more accomplished older brother, highlighting John's perceived lack of diligence. Enchanted by John's attention, Lorraine willingly follows his lead as he, along with his troublemaking friends Norton and Dennis, embark on misadventures such as breaking into the local cemetery for alcohol-fueled escapades. Norton is portrayed as a morally corrupted individual, and John openly admits his dislike for him. Boredom often leads the teenagers to engage in prank calls, competing to see who can keep unsuspecting victims on the phone the longest. One fateful day, Lorraine dials a number belonging to Angelo Pignotti, assuming the role of a charitable worker, collecting funds. Mr. Pignotti proves to be a kind-hearted man who enjoys sharing silly jokes. When he offers to donate $10, Lorraine's guilt surfaces, and she wishes to end the prank. However, John seizes the opportunity to obtain the money for beer and urges Lorraine to inform Mr. Pignotti that they will personally collect the donation the following day. As they arrive at Mr. Pignotti's house, adopting false identities, they discover a lonely man residing in a dilapidated home. Overjoyed to have their company, Mr. Pignotti welcomes them with open arms, unaware of their true intentions. Welcoming them inside, Mr. Pignotti shares his cherished collection of ceramic pigs, which he began amassing when he met his late wife. He excitedly tells John and Lorraine about his daily visits to the zoo and extends an invitation for them to join him the next day. 
Offering them a check for $10 to cash, Mr. Pignotti's generosity is swiftly taken advantage of by John, who promptly uses the money to buy beer. John and Lorraine decide to skip school in order to accompany Mr. Pignotti on their zoo adventure. At the zoo, Mr. Pignotti introduces them to his beloved baboon, Bobo, whom he considers his closest companion. While the encounter strikes the teenagers as peculiar, they gradually develop an affection for the elderly man and relish the sense of belonging they experience in his company, a stark contrast to their own troubled lives. Mr. Pignotti takes them on a trip to Beekman's department store in the city, where he indulges them with unusual and exotic foods. The trio even purchases roller skates and joyfully glides through the sporting goods section. As their visits to Mr. Pignotti's home become more frequent, John neglects his school responsibilities, while Lorraine continues to deceive her increasingly suspicious mother, who questions her Latin club cover story. One evening, while in the company of the pigmen, John stumbles upon a receipt for Mr. Pignotti's wife, Conchetta's, funeral. He confides in Lorraine, and overwhelmed by guilt, she confesses that the phone call was nothing more than a prank and reveals their true identities as high school students, not charity workers. Mr. Pignotti, trying to hide his pain behind tears, admits to his wife's passing and discloses that he keeps her clothing and jewelry as a source of comfort. The collection of pig figurines serves as a poignant memorial to his lost love. Although hurt by the deception, Mr. Pignotti quickly forgives John and Lorraine. They all put on their roller skates and glide through the house, embracing a carefree moment. In a spirited game of tag initiated by John, tragedy strikes as Mr. Pignotti suffers a heart attack while chasing him up the stairs, ultimately leading to a devastating fall. While Mr. Pignotti recuperates in the hospital, John and Lorraine take it upon themselves to look after his house. Despite promising to visit Bobo, their attention is diverted as they indulge in a game of make-believe, trying on the Pignatus clothing and pretending to be adults. Their romantic moment takes a sharp turn as domestic disputes erupt over mundane chores like washing dishes and taking out the trash. Frustrated, John decides to throw a party and invites a few friends. Lorraine objects, but her resistance is feeble as John rounds up all the alcohol in the house and finalizes the guest list, making sure to exclude Norton due to concerns about theft. As the party kicks off, things quickly spiral out of control, with uninvited guests arriving in droves and excessive drinking becoming the norm. Lorraine, along with other girls, dons Conchetta's gowns, unintentionally damaging some of them in the process. The once peaceful house transforms into a chaotic scene, teeming with 40 intoxicated teenagers and a live band. John's worst fears materialize when he spots Norton entering the premises. Realizing he has lost control, John, wearing his roller skates, drunkenly pursues Norton upstairs, where Norton attempts to pilfer Mr. Pignotti's broken electronics. A scuffle ensues between the two boys, and Norton manages to escape downstairs, where Lorraine's cries reveal that Mr. Pignotti has unexpectedly returned from the hospital. In a fit of rage, Norton shatters the collection of pig figurines before John tackles him to the ground. In the midst of the commotion, Mr. Pignotti opens the front door, causing John to lose consciousness. The police are called, but Mr. Pignotti decides against pressing charges. The officers escort the unruly teens home, and Lorraine's mother slaps her in a fit of anger upon discovering her daughter's lies. The following day, John and Lorraine reach out to Mr. Pignotti to apologize and offer their assistance in cleaning up the house. His responses are sparse, but Lorraine pleads with him, even proposing to accompany him on a visit to Bobo. Reluctantly, Mr. Pignotti agrees, and they rendezvous at the zoo the next morning. Despite his frail appearance, they eagerly purchase peanuts and head to the primate house with Mr. Pignotti. However, their anticipation turns to heartbreak as they discover an empty enclosure. The zookeeper delivers the devastating news that Bobo had passed away the previous week due to pneumonia. Overwhelmed by grief, Mr. Pignotti lets out a cry and collapses, succumbing to yet another heart attack. In a state of panic, Lorraine flees the scene while John remains by Mr. Pignotti's lifeless body until the arrival of the ambulance. As he waits, a profound sense of existential crisis engulfs John, forcing him to confront his own mortality. Meanwhile, Lorraine sits despondently on a bench in the zoo, grappling with her own emotions. When they finally reunite, Lorraine accuses them of being responsible for the tragic events, labeling them as murderers. 
John remains silent but internalizes the weight of their actions, acknowledging the truth behind her words. I hope you enjoyed this video, leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe thank you.